One man is single-handedly trying to prevent the world from facing up to the facts about the global crisis. Gordon Brown wants the world's leaders to back his agenda. That agenda is shaped by his state of denial. Britain's Prime Minister is desperate to persuade us that he has done nothing wrong. He doesn't have to apologise for locking Britain into a housing boom that ended in a crash. Brown has brainwashed himself into thinking his self-serving policies will save the world. And now he wants to brainwash the rest of us. But his policies will trigger the next disastrous boom bust. And I have said before, Mr Deputy Speaker, no return to boom and bust. When the housing bubble was pricked at the end of 2007, Gordon Brown tried to explain away his failure. As an artful actor, he used the magic of theatre to camouflage his abject failure as a politician. Brown defends his record with facts that are fraudulent. You guys just don't get it, do you? You're saying I got it wrong, but I didn't. Get in the real world. It's not my fault. The Prime Minister has tortured his mind into believing he is innocent. He clings to his fantasy that he terminated the boom-bust syndrome. If this was a private mental crisis one man tried to hoodwink historians, we could ignore this exercise in self-delusion. But his attempt to vindicate himself is liable to deepen the global downturn. So we should all be concerned with Gordon Brown's state of mind. Brown has fabricated a defence which bears no resemblance to the facts. He says he prevented inflation from flaring. He wants us to believe that this meant the economy would not have collapsed if there had not been a housing crisis in America. He places all the blame on failure at the international financial level. This is reminiscent of Neville Chamberlain returning from Munich with Adolf Hitler's signature to persuade the world that there would be peace with Nazi Germany. Today, Brown's monumental act of duplicity will be felt around the world. The UN estimates that between 200 and 400,000 infants will die every year from the poverty resulting from the global downturn. Brown is washing his hands of responsibility. Worse still, he wants us to believe that he holds the keys to future prosperity. Let's look at three issues which expose his fraudulent claims. Brown says that the boom in Britain's house prices cannot be blamed on inflation. He says these prices were due to a shortfall in the supply of new dwellings. This is economic nonsense. House prices shot up even in countries where builders constructed record numbers of houses. Look at what happened in Spain. It was constructing a massive 800,000 new units in one year. That did not stop record high prices, nor did it prevent the collapse of Spain's property market. The same thing happened in Ireland. The British economy is 12 times larger than Ireland's, and yet Ireland built 93,000 houses at the peak of production. That's more than half of what Britain's builders could construct, a pathetic 152,000 dwellings. Even so, Ireland's house prices became unaffordable, but not because of the cost of building materials. The disruption was caused by an explosion in the cost of land. In 1997, the economic facts of life were spelt out for Gordon Brown. The key to understanding the impact of the property market is to be found in the prices that people pay for land. Brown failed to prevent the speculation in land. That guaranteed a recession. Brown's second line of defense is that bankers acted recklessly. They didn't assess risks in the housing market. And yet it was Gordon Brown who repeatedly praised and promoted the culture of risk. The better, and in my opinion, the correct modern model of regulation, the risk-based approach, is no inspection without justification, no form filling without justification, and no information requirements without justification. Not just a light touch, but a limited touch. In fact, Brown championed risk-taking in the financial sector to the point where he was even questioning, quote, whether to regulate at all. Brown was warned by Peter Hayne, one of his cabinet colleagues, that the culture of risk was leading to obscene profits and bonuses. Hayne was given the brush off. I got a pretty cool reaction from the Treasury, and number 10 wasn't all that ecstatic. I just thought it was pure greed, and it was not sustainable. Brown's third line of defense is that tighter regulation of banks is needed to prevent future financial crises. But he set the rules for regulating Britain's banks in 1997. 
If property booms could be prevented by regulation, he had the power to prevent bankers from recklessly lending to land speculators. But over the past three centuries, we've had all kinds of regulation. No regulation of banks in the 19th century, very tight regulation after the depression of the 1930s, and then Brown's light touch controls in the 1990s. Throughout those 300 years, bankers profited from property booms which turned to busts. And they will repeat that folly again if Brown gets his way. Brown did not just fail on the macro scale. His micromanagement of the economy has also been a disaster. One of his first decisions when he came to power was to sell off a major slice of Britain's gold when prices were at an historic low. What if that bullion was still in the Bank of England's vaults today? Britain would be in a stronger position to combat the economic storms. A leopard doesn't change its spots. More recently, Brown's attempt to handle the financial crisis has been a disaster for the shareholders of Lloyd's Bank. Lloyd's was the soundest of Britain's banks. It stood the best chance of weathering the storm. But Brown brokered the deal for Lloyd's to take over HBOS, the bank riddled with toxic mortgages. Result? In the 12 months following March 2007, Lloyd's shares collapsed from over £4 to a miserable 42 pence. The one politician to come out of this disaster with his reputation unsullied is Vince Cable. He's the Member of Parliament who has studied Gordon Brown at close quarters. I asked him to describe the Prime Minister's mindset. It was, it's very strange trying to analyse it because if you go back to some of his quotes in 1997, he actually used language about boom and bust in housing markets and clearly understood there was such a phenomenon. Uh, I recall raising this with him in Parliament publicly for the first time about 2003, pre-budget report, and he just swatted the whole issue away. And until very, very recently, I, I believe he still hasn't accepted that the whole problem around the housing market, personal debt, actually exists. I mean, a few weeks ago, I think he was still justifying 100% mortgages, which by definition in a falling market will lead you into but, negative equity. But you've actually discussed this with him and put it to him that there was a housing bubble, but he rejected it. Yes, I, I think the first time explicitly and publicly was five years, more than five years ago, and I've returned to the theme since. Anything Brown touches turns to dust. Compared with the previous two business cycles, under Brown's stewardship, Britain has had a lower peak in output and a deeper downturn. And we not only saved the world, uh, saved the banks and saved... <laughs> Saved the banks and led the way. We not only saved the bank. The Brown syndrome is infecting some of the world's leaders. They really believe the Prime Minister's publicity, that he took the tough decisions, that he was prudent as an architect of a successful economy. If they are not careful, they will pay as heavy a price as the one now being paid by the people of Britain. If Brown was just trying to con historians of the future, that would be a matter for his conscience. But he's trying to brainwash the rest of us. And that spells disaster not just for Britain, but also for the rest of the world.